take your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 tonight. 1 Corinthians 11, now either during the message or during the communion portion of the service, we oftentimes turn to 1 Corinthians 11 and just kind of read through it and remind ourselves once again, and, and uh, I think reminders are good. It's good for us to, to visit those passages, and certainly there are times when um, you go back to familiar passages or, or similar passages and, and kind of renew your mind on those things and just kind of talk through uh, what has happened. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that time. Just kind of focus on, on one section of it, and I think it fits with uh, the season, uh, the, the time of year that we are in. 1 Corinthians 11, and if you found verse number 24, if you'll stand, and we want to honor the reading of God's Word tonight, just a couple of verses, and uh, we'll um, get into the message tonight. 1 Corinthians 11, and verse number 24. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, help us now. As we look into this passage, help us understand it. And Lord, to understand the significance of what we're about to observe here in the Lord's Supper, in the communion service. And certainly this is a, just a, it's an exciting time. It's a fun time. It's a, a spiritual time. And so, Lord, we want to treat it as such. But Lord, it's not, uh, it's not a time for us to be in mourning. We're, we're remembering the great things you've done for us, so help it to be a joyful time. And Lord, certainly when we look within ourselves and, and we allow you to spread your, allow your spirit to, to do its work, to, to go through every aspect of our heart, of our mind, of our life, Lord, to reveal things that need to be confessed and forsaken, that need to be cleansed away. Lord, that's a good time. And so help us, please, to do that. Help us to be prepared in our heart and our life for what we're about to, to partake in. And we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Well, as we prepare to partake in the Lord's Supper tonight, we're observing one of the two ordinances that God has given to the local church. One of those being baptism, of course. We've talked about that in recent weeks. And then this, the Lord's Supper, the communion service. We use those two terms really interchangeably. Uh, it's a wonderful time of remembrance. Certainly, I think the, the passage, the two verses that we just read is Jesus is giving some instruction. And really, the, Paul is quoting Jesus' words in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. It's a, it's a wonderful time that God has given to us to remember what Christ has done. But the value of what, what we're going to partake in tonight, the, the value of this experience or this ordinance that we're going to participate in, really depends on the condition of your heart. It's, it's, this is the same. We, we've prepared the unleavened bread and we've pre prepared the, the unfermented grape juice. And it's all the same. It, it's, it hasn't changed. But what the value of, of what we're about to, to do, the value of that lies, again, in the condition of my heart personally and of every Christian person tonight. How, how have you prepared your heart? How have you prepared your life for what you're about to participate in? And so I try to read through this passage and just prepare my own heart and ask the Lord, is there something between you and I? Is there something between a Christian brother, a Christian sister that, that is, would, would hinder my participation in partaking in the Lord's Supper? Because I think it's important for us to understand that what we're doing is observing the, the body symbolically that was broken for us, that's Jesus' body, and the blood that was shed for us. So it doesn't, it's not right for me to partake of those elements uh, in remembrance in, in, in a symbolic fashion if I'm still just living in sin. It, it defeats why I'm, I'm observing the Lord's Supper. And so we would say, in fact, Paul would say later in this passage about uh, uh, examining himself. In fact, it's there in verse number 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You're not understanding what's going in here. But that's for another message and another time. And, and just to be pointed out, really one that I wanted to, to focus on here is found a little phrase in verse number 24. And it's really the first phrase that Paul uses in verse number 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. It's really kind of the title if you want to have one for the message. And when he had given thanks. 
Now think about who's giving the thanks. Is it Paul? <laughs> no, no. The he in verse number 24 is the Lord Jesus Christ. When, when Christ had given thanks. And so that's just kind of the, the focus of the, the, the message tonight. It won't be long necessarily, but I, I want us to just focus on this and, and think about it. And, and think about the, the master giving thanks. All right? And, and think about who he is. Number one, he's the creator of all the world. <laughs> He, he created everything and, and all that we see. Colossians 1 and verse number 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That's Christ. So in speaking about Christ, verse number 16 of Colossians 1. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities of powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So I want, to ask our, I want us to ask ourselves a question. If the creator of this world would offer thanks, how much more should I offer thanks? For, for what God has done for me, yes. For what God provides for me, yes. If, if Jesus Christ, who made everything, who, who owns everything, who keeps everything together, the verse we just read, by Him all things consist. If He gives thanks, <laughs> then doggone it, I should give thanks. I ought to be a thankful person. And we as Christians ought to be thankful people. So yes, He's creator of the world, but He is also co-equal with the Heavenly Father. He is God in the flesh. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. When, when Thomas sees Christ after he is resurrected, after he has even said, I won't uh, believe it's you until I'm able to, to, to touch the, the nail prints in your hand and thrust my hand into your side. And Jesus offers that to him. And what is Thomas's reaction? And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. He is God in the flesh. And if God in the flesh can offer thanks to His heavenly Father, he, 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 He's equal with God, yes, He is God, but He is in a submissive role in His human form. He is giving thanks to His heavenly Father for everything that He has provided to Him. It is a, a, a thanks from the Master. Secondly, I want us to, to think about the moment that Jesus is giving thanks uh, here in the passage of Scripture. Think about this. It is a moment of agony in his personal life. He, if you read through the passage in John where Jesus is instructing his disciples, he is, he's giving them some kind of final um, warnings, if you will, some kind of final regards, and he's, he's instructing them about all that's going to take place, and he's reminding them about some of the things that he's already taught them several times. And the Bible talks about, in fact, uh, John chapter 16 the, the disciples answer him and, and say, Lord, you know all things. Well, if he knows all things, does he know who is going to betray him? Yes, yes. Does he know what is going to be facing him? And just, by the way, in, in that passage in John, it, it's not like days at a time. It is one specific day that we get all this detail on, beginning about uh, John 12 or John 13. All of this, this, this stuff is going on in, in the space of one day, of one evening. And, and Jesus knows what's going to take place in just a few hours. In just a few hours from, from these words that Jesus speaks, He is going to make His way into the Garden of Gethsemane. He is going to pray and sweat as it were dr great drops of blood, the Bible says. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be arrested and falsely tried and put on a cruel Roman cross. He knows what is going to be facing Him. And yet 1 Corinthians 11 verse number 24 says what? When He had given thanks. In the moment of agony, Jesus gave thanks. Speaking about Jonathan today, and he just mentioned, we, we were talking, and uh, he mentioned an illustration that a, a pastor friend of his and a man that I've met, a pastor's out in San Diego, had used about Corey Ten Boom. Maybe, maybe you've read uh, the book uh, by Corey Ten Boom, The Hiding Place. Just a tremendous story that the Ten Boom family were, were watchmakers in Holland 
And they were devout Christians. And because they had read the Bible, they understood that God had a special place for the Jew. He, he had a plan and a purpose for the, the Jewish people. And so it, during World War II, as Hitler is making his way across Europe and he's trying to eradicate the, the Jewish people, they would hide Jews in their home. And so the, the, the book is a, just a, it's an amazing story about how this kind of took place. And, and there's a part of the book where the tin booms are found out and they are captured. And they are taken to Ravensbrück uh, uh, concentration camp. It's a, a place just north of Berlin in Germany. And while she is there with her sister, they're in uh, the holding area and the, the place is infested with these fleas. And Corey Ten Boom tells the story about uh, one night they were, as the, 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 the room is darkening and there's not really a whole lot of light for them to see, all of a sudden she feels a bite on her leg and she, she lurches up and hits her head on the, the bunk over top of her and, and she realizes that it's fleas that are, that are on both her and her sister and all of these, these ladies that are in their, their specific room. And she, she goes to her sister and she's complaining about these fleas and the conditions that they're in. And her sister reminded her of the Bible verse that they had been reading through. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. It's amazing how God brings those things to our remembrance. She said, Corey, remember the Bible verse that we were just reading, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. She challenged her sister, Corey Tin Boom, to give thanks for the fleas. Corey's response was maybe what you might be thinking. <laughs> How do I do that? How do I give thanks for the fleas? But she made a choice to offer thanks for the fleas anyway. Now, during this time, Corey Tin Boom and her sister had been uh, uh, offering Bible studies in a room that was kind of set off from where they were being held in their, their concentration camp. And they, they noticed that the German guards would never come into the, the, the meeting room. They, they never entered into the space. They allowed them to kind of teach freely uh, the gospel. In fact, they had led many of the young ladies in where they were staying to the Lord as a result of these Bible studies. Well, as they're thanking God for the fleas and as they go through their days, she later found out that the reason why the, the, the German guards would not come into the room is because the place was infested with fleas and they didn't want to get the fleas on them. Well, they could thank God for fleas because it kept their, the German guards away, allowed the gospel to be spread through something like getting bites all over their body? Can you imagine? And then you and I, we're so sorry. We, we can't find ten things to thank the, thank the Lord for. Read this poem and I thought it fit. Even though I clutch my blankets and groan when the alarm rings each morning. Thank you, Lord, that I can hear. There are those that are deaf. Even though I keep my eyes tightly closed against the morning light as long as possible. Thank you, Lord, that I can see. There are many who are blind. Even though I huddle in my bed and put off the physical effort of rising, thank you, Lord, that I have strength to rise. There are many who are fast in their beds. Even though the first hour of my day is hectic when socks are lost, toast is burned, tempers are short, thank you, Lord, for my family. There are many who are lonely. Even though our table never looks like the pictures in the magazines and the menu is at times unbalanced, thank you, Lord, for the food we have. There are many who are hungry. Even though the routine of my job is monotonous, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to work. There are many who have no work. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life you have given to me. So Jesus can give thanks at a, a moment of agony in, of, in his life, but not only a moment of agony, he knows what's coming. Think about this. It is also a moment of betrayal. One of the 12 men who he has personally handpicked, he has selected, he has discipled, he has, he has uh, taught and, and shown the, the, the way of life to, he knows that in, in just a few moments, this man will, will betray him to the, the, the Roman guards. Jesus is omniscient. He, he knew who would betray him. And, and I can't help but think that if, if you and I think at times there, there's someone who is against us or we perceive that they're prejudiced against us in some way, 
then you know what we often do is we refrain our heart from them. We, we, we kind of put up the wall. And we try to avoid them. We don't want to talk to them. Uh, you know, if they're going to be mad, then I can be mad back at them. But in the few minutes before he gets betrayed, you know what Jesus does? He gives thanks. He gives thanks. In a moment of agony in his life, in a moment of betrayal, Jesus dined with the very one who would betray him. He is the master. He gave thanks. There's the, the moment of thanks that we read about. But third, what's the message of thanks? What is it that causes us or should cause us to be thankful? Why are, why are we going to observe the Lord's Supper tonight? Well, look back at verse 24 and 25 of 1 Corinthians 11. Remember this, first of all, we're here because Jesus Christ died for us. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now, let's be very clear. When Jesus says that, is he talking about it being his actual body? No, no, he's standing there right in front of them. He's not talking about them eating his actual body. We in no way believe that this bread, this unleavened bread, becomes the body or blood of Christ in some way. That, that's ridiculous. In fact, what Jesus says, notice, he says we do this again in remembrance of him. So until he comes again, we do this. He's not in these elements tonight, nor is what we are about to partake in. This is not a part of salvation. You don't get more saved by taking this. You don't get saved at all by taking this. You're remembering what God has already done in your life. This is not for a lost person to partake in. This is for a saved person to partake in. We, we remember that Jesus Christ died for us. It is not in Jesus' life that, that, that we can claim eternal life. It is not in, even in His teachings that we can uh, claim eternal life. It is in His death, His burial, and in His resurrection. Isaiah 53 in verse number 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to His own way, and the Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Remember, number one, Christ died for us. Secondly, remember, verse 26, he's coming again. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till when? Till he come. We are inundated, it seems like, with the call for world peace. And popes call for it, and religious leaders, and, and social figures, they all call for world peace. But the issue is, there's not going to be world peace until Jesus Christ returns again. Until He sets everything to be right. He, he died for us, we remember that. We remember He's coming again. And then according to verse number 28, we, we remember to love Him today. Love Him participate correctly in what we're doing here. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself. Lord, is there anything between us? Is there anything between me and someone else that I need to make right? Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You, you need to discern, verse 29, discern the Lord's body. Know what it is that you are remembering tonight. I, I certainly think we understand that thankfulness can be a lost art in the day and time in which we live. I read a story of a man named Edward Spencer, 1860 near Evanston, Illinois, on the, near the campus of, of Northwestern University, right in that Chicago area. There was a ship that, that collided with another ship, the, the Lady Elgin connect, uh, co collided with another ship. Edward Spencer saw what had gone on, and, and he was a, a volunteer lifeguard. Spencer tied a rope around his waist, and he had some people stand on the shore, and he went out 17 times into the cold, icy waters to rescue 17 people from this shipwreck. 
And every time as he would grab up another survivor, the people on the shore would pull him back and he would go back out and go back out. And he was cut on his legs and, and, and cut up in his midsection from the rocky shore. And, and, and yet he kept on going back and kept on going back. In fact, after he uh, came to land for the last time and realized he had no more strength, he was bound to a wheelchair for the rest of his life because of these injuries that he sustained. There's even today, there's a, a little placard in the gymnasium at Northwestern University commemorating Edward Spencer and, and his rescue of these 17 lives in 1860. There was a class reunion for this, his class at Northwestern and, and uh, a classmate of his who was kind of being the MC had remembered this event and called Edward Spencer forward to just speak about uh, maybe some things that he remembered from that night. He said, really, there's only one thing that I really remember. Out of the 17 people that were rescued that night, not one of them came back to say thank you. Not one. The, the master gave thanks He's creator God. He, he was thankful. He, he is equal with God. He was thankful. The moment of thanks, well, it's a moment of agony. It's a moment of betrayal. But the message of thanks is this. Remember, Jesus died for you. Remember, he's coming again. Remember, my, my duty is not to work to keep my salvation. My duty is to love him. And because I love him, I serve him with my heart, soul, mind, and strength. 2 Corinthians 9, verse number 15. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. And when He had given thanks, William Shakespeare said this, O Lord, that lends me life. Lend me a heart replete with thankfulness. Is that a prayer that you and I pray? Or is it more, Lord, would you take care of my problem? Would you take care of this person? Would you remove this from my life instead of thanking God for the fleas? Thanking God for what he's done for you. Can, can I just explain something? Uh, you, you know this. I just wanted to, to, to settle in our minds. If you and I are homeless, if you and I have no scraps of food... If you and I have nothing but the clothes on our backs, you understand if you've trusted Christ, He's done so many mighty things for you. Amen. He's provided life and breath to you. We ought to give thanks.